Okay, so it's 1.30. Um, I, will, I will start. Um, now, you'll have to, I'm going to apologize right now for my Zoom etiquette because I have not, uh, this is my first Zoom hosting experience, to be honest. We use Google Meets all the time. And uh, I couldn't really practice being a host because I don't have a, you know, an enterprise or it's, it's sort of, so I, I might, I might uh, fumble a bit here and I've got, you know, I've got a screen on my right. I got a, a mixing board to be all cool. And then, and then I've got what's happening on Zoom. So I apologize if I'm uh, a bit slow here. We've all seen pretty much every Zoom. Yeah, at this point, it doesn't really make a big year, difference, does it? Yeah, yeah. Actually, there's no point <laughs> in giving any kind of excuse over, over Zoom. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm Zoomed out, that's for sure. Okay, so uh, um, I'm going to start. Um, basically, thanks for everyone for being here. Um, I am really excited to, to be a part of this workshop. And uh, so I'll give a little intro uh, as to why, sort of a little bit about how it came about. And then um, we'll introduce the, those who are um, our, our leaders in the group here. Um, and then we'll get into some demos and, and some making. So uh, very excited, it, it should be a fun, a fun time. Uh, let me close. The Fab Labs IO portal has a lot of blips and beeps and stuff. Okay, so let's get started. That's the famous YouTube line, right? Okay, so uh, cardboard code creativity. So I'm just going to start quickly, just to sort of establish, you know, the perspective that I'm that is coming here from the Fab Lab perspective. So my uh, we run a Fab Lab here, and like in many schools and community uh, centers, we you know teach people how to make all kinds of things. Um, integrating electronics and code into objects, um, but a lot of it's really drawing on the computer and cutting and and make and digital fabrication. Um, and just like every other fab lab, we you know, if we look at the list of um, labs that are the, the expertise that are at the fab conference, you'll see just how many of them are educators. So in our school, obviously, we try to integrate these great ideas into uh, you know education and get teachers involved into pedagogy, and that's not always smooth. It's a it's a work in progress all the time. Um, but you know, we we develop a language for this. And I don't know if the language is always present in let's say I did when I did Fab Academy, this language was not always there. This sort of happens on on the floor in the classroom or in the workshop uh, space. So but but like every fab lab we do the the making the objects. Um, but one of the things that dawned on me as we're learning on the floor is just how excited kids get when they're working with their hands and when they're working with basic materials uh, and tinkering in, in the lab. And this flow of work that happens in the space, it doesn't always translate to the fabrication experience. And I think we have a lot of experts here that can talk to this. Um, so my interest in our lab and, and my colleague Craig as well, who's in the, and you can see a little icon of Fabi's waving his arms back there. Um, we are very interested in sort of the tinkerability of Fab Labs. So how do you, how do you make this technology something that you can tinker with so that you can, you can come in and just mess around and do it safely and build ideas as you go. So that's a real passion for me and it's, a, in, it's basically, um, Sort of how our lab is set up. Our lab is very much a creative, creativity first kind of fab lab. Um, so, with the, I'll just go into quick introductions. So, my name uh, is Alec Mathewson. I um, did Fab Academy in 2018. I'm an artist um, and designer, and I, I'm a fab lab coordinator at Lower Canada College. Um, and I was uh, in, Having known Brian Silverman, I got to learn more about the logo programming language. So this is just a picture of uh, my Fab Academy project, which I wanted it to uh, run on logo. And then um, I'm very interested in, um, you know, right now I'm doing a master's degree and I'm, my focus is on building uh, toolkits that encourage creativity and interventions with technology and learning through design. Um, so this is sort of the idea of tinkering in Fab Labs has become a real focus for me. Um, I'm very excited to uh, introduce Josh Berker. Um, Josh is an artist, an educator, an author, um, and an educational technologist, most recently with the School of Columbia University. He will join, uh, I think this year he's joining Marymount School in New York City uh, as a, managing their upper middle division fab lab. 
Um, Josh's work exhibits a fresh sense of curiosity for electronics, code, and craft, and I know I use him as an example all the time. Um, Josh is also very good at documenting his work, and he shares his process, inspiring others with a playful approach to critical making. Uh, and he is the author uh, of the book, the, um, Invent to Learn, the Invent to Learn Guide to Fun. Brian Silverman is probably, uh, you, know, you might have read about Brian if you do research in, in making and, uh, and sort of learning in schools, but since 1970s, Brian Silverman has been involved in the invention of learning environments for children. His work includes dozens of Lego versions, Lego Writer, the Micro Worlds, among them Scratch, Lego Robotics, Turtle Art, and Pico Cricket, and the Phantom Fish Tank. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I've got... My notes, there you go, that's Brian's slide, sorry. Um, and this is a, a great picture that Brian uh, pulled out of his archives. Um, Brian has been a visiting scientist at the MIT Media Lab. He enjoys recreational math and is a computer scientist and master tinkerer. And he, this is a picture of him working on a tic-tac-toe playing computer made out of tinker toys. And this was, a, I believe there's two, and, and this, is, this is one of them and that is, um, if you can see pictures of that, it's pretty, pretty uh, incredible. And then lastly on the list uh, is Craig Hanning. Um, I met Craig just through this workshop and I'm really uh, excited to go to work with him. Uh, a graduate from the Lifelong Kindergarten Group at the MIT Media Lab, Craig Hanning's work involves designing tools that blend digital and physical making. Um, and sorry. I've got the Zoom chirping on the back on here. Uh, Craig has collaborated with companies like Lego, Arduino, Microbit, Raspberry Pi to develop computational tools. Craig was part of the first cohort of Lego paper fellows as a, res as a research collaboration between MIT Media Lab and Lego. Uh, here, Craig is enjoying some relax relaxation time in a Duplo pool in the newly constructed Lego house in Midland, Denmark. So uh, that's uh, just a, a quick, um, introduction. I'm going to change my screen here for a sec. Make sure there's no one. There we go. Okay. So I'm going to pass over the, um, I'm going to let um, Craig, I don't know if you can share your screen. I'm going to. Yeah, let me, oh, looks like um host has disabled screen sharing yeah give me a sec here yeah yeah sure it always yeah. happens the first time yeah and and let's go does that work now uh, let's try again yes yeah, so it looks like it's letting me know perfect okay let me choose the right screen all right great hopefully you all are able to see my my presentation screen now excellent um, yeah, so before we jump in and start talking about the technology um, and, and start playing with some of the tools today, we thought we'd talk just a little bit uh, to set kind of the context of this project, uh, why we developed Crafty Bits and some of the terms we use that we might throw around as we're talking about them. So we thought we'd start with the term microworld. Uh, some of you may hear us say that, that term and, and we'll often use that when we're referring to this type of exploration. Uh, and there's many different definitions of micro world out there. We're just going to give our definition or at least the way we like to think about it. We're not um, trying to say that this is the definitive definition of a micro world. Uh, but we like to think about a micro world as a collection of materials and ideas that go together for learning. Um, so, you know, kind of bringing all of these ideas together and just to say it in a more simple way to do one thing or do one collection of things and to do it very well. Um, so even though today we're going to be talking about a general purpose microcontroller board, uh, we can still view this work as a micro world because the, the sort of inputs, the outputs, the types of ways of interacting with this device, we've sort of collected in a way uh, that should seamlessly move uh, between the different ideas inside of the project. So we'll think of this kind of as a micro world, uh, kind of globally. And then we wanted to mention some of the design guidelines that we think about while we're designing systems like this. So in the Lifelong Kindergarten Research Group, we like to talk about designing for low floors, wide walls, and high ceilings. Um, some of you may have heard this before. I think these ideas started with Seymour Papert, uh, and then Mitchell Resnick, uh, my, my thesis advisor, had added on the wide walls to this analogy. But the idea is that low floors make it easy to get started with a project. 
Uh, wide walls provide a diversity of pathways and projects as you're engaging in a system. And high ceilings that you don't run out of things to do quickly, that there's uh, you can kind of increasingly engage in complex projects um, as you kind of get to know a system. So, you know, we took these these three design guidelines and I thought a little bit of, you know, how do we apply those into the context of this project, the Crafty Bits project? Um, you know, while those are really good general principles, uh, we maybe can think a little bit more deeply of how they apply to this one. So the low floors, uh, making things simple, not trivial. Right, so low floors doesn't mean everything is easy or everything is sort of spoon fed or handed to you. Uh, we did curate a list of commands that we think are really easy to get started with, but by no means can you only do very superficial or very trivial things with them. You know, you can certainly do more advanced projects. Uh, wide walls that parts of the system should feel familiar. So while you're playing with crafty bits, you might be interacting with a servo motor or a ring of NeoPixel LEDs or maybe you've plugged in some analog sensor into the system, those various parts of this system should feel connected in some way. They should feel sort of seamless as you move between them. So if you unplug your servo motor and you move to a NeoPixel ring, we don't want you to have to kind of scrap everything you've learned, start over again and say, okay, now how does this part of the system work? It should really feel seamless as you're kind of moving around the different aspects of the project. And for high ceilings, um, so right now this is a kind of, pre-built system, you can't add additional, like you can't solder in new parts to the board. Um, so the technology isn't really the high ceiling and, and you can you know, plug in different sensors. So in a sense, there, there's some technology, but we really wanna think more about the content being the high ceiling for this. That this system can you know, be used for all kinds of art making, uh, mural design, whatever you might be interested in, you can take this system and go really deep with it and build very polished, professional looking uh, artifacts using the crafty bit system so just a little glimpse of kind of how we've thought about uh, integrating these design guidelines into this crafty bits project um, and we'll have discussions later on throughout the session so we can talk about this we can talk in more depth about the design of the crafty bit and kind of our design guidelines going forward but uh, for now maybe brian is just going to lead us to a little bit of a discussion around this idea of uh, integrating more art in engineering and uh, tinker versus planner so, yeah, one of the things is the intersection of fab and education. People often say STEAM or STEM. And one of the things that we decided that we wanted to focus on was a couple of the underserved letters like the um, A for art, the M for math, and the S for science. And the stuff that we're doing is really, we're, we're trying to build kits that artists would be fairly comfortable with and kind of Alec is, has been in on it because he introduced himself as an artist. And at some level, we were almost thinking of the designing of this as, you know, okay, um, what would Alec do with it if we built such a thing? One of the things that you know, I think differentiates, um, well, Tinkerer versus Planner, the E in STEM is, is engineering. Engineers really plan things before building them, is work it all out. And then when it comes time to engage the actual materials, you already kind of know what you're doing. Where being a tinkerer is really much more figuring out what you're doing while doing it, which works really effectively if the materials are sufficiently forgiving and you know allow for sufficient iteration. So that's kind of behind the, you know, that's kind of behind the way we've been trying to build things. So then we thought we'd talk a little bit about the Crafty Bits design, uh, introduce the device to everyone, and then maybe play with a couple of demos together. So before we get to demos, we can talk a little bit about the history and kind of how we've gotten to this point and some of the inspiration behind the Crafty Bit device. Um, so as I was going through this, just realizing, I think one constant through all of this, I think is Brian. I'm pretty sure he's been involved in just about all of these, these past tools and developments that I'll mention today. And there's many other ideas that have come into this and that we've used as inspiration, but I just wanted to highlight kind of the, some of the key ones throughout history. Um, so there was, let's see here, the very first one was the programmable brick, uh, which was developed at the MIT Media Lab. And it began as the MIT logo brick, which is the one that you'll see up in the top left-hand corner. Uh, that eventually evolved, went through a few iterations, and eventually became the first LEGO robotics kit, uh, the LEGO RCX. So some of you may remember this kit directly. Brian can talk more about that in the future, too, if anyone has any specific questions over these devices. Uh, but the Pico Cricket was kind of similar in many ways to the programmable brick, um, but it did, it did uh, diverge a little bit. So 
While the programmable brick was really about attaching bricks and additional Lego components and then using that in your creations, the Pico Cricket put an emphasis on craft materials. So inside of the, so even though the Pico Cricket also had actuators and sensors you could plug into the board, um, it came with a, a variety of craft materials like pipe cleaners, fuzzy balls, felt pieces. I believe there was even a jingly bell inside of the kit just to kind of inspire people at different things that they might use this to create, that it's not just about the bricks at the end of the day. Uh, then uh, there was Scratch hardware extension. So this was actually my introduction into this world. Um, I got, I, uh, when I first joined Lifelong Kindergarten Group, I got connected with David Mellis, who's one of the creators of Arduino. Um, and the first project we did together was creating a Scratch extension for Arduino. Um, and then later after that, I, I moved on to the Microbit, which is kind of a new uh, development platform many folks are probably familiar with today. It's a really low cost, a wonderful board. So I had helped create the official Scratch extension for Microbit device. Um, but you know, in developing those extensions, they gave me some powerful insight into how um, you know how powerful microworlds can be uh, when you're designing these kind of tools. Because Arduino and Microbit are very much general purpose, and in Scratch, it, Scratch is a general purpose programming language, but it does put a strong emphasis on the low floors that make it easy to get started uh, for people who haven't engaged in coding or making activities before. And that was a little bit at odds with these kind of general purpose systems like Arduino and Microbit. So what we ended up doing is really distilling down the Arduino and the Microbit language and making it kind of a direct control mechanism for Scratch. So you weren't so much programming the microcontroller boards in a traditional sense. Uh, instead, it was just kind of an input output connected to your Scratch project. So on the Microbit example, you could use the LED matrix for displaying information from Scratch. Uh, you could use the buttons and the motion sensors for inputs into your Scratch projects to make things happen on the screen. But as soon as the extension goes away, or as soon as you break that connection, the microbit and the Arduino don't do anything. They, they kind of operate in this direct control mode with Scratch. Um, and that, in a sense, is a micro world in that it's, you know, it's not a full download and run system like Arduino and microbit. It's just kind of a little slice at engaging uh, with these kind of physical activities using a Scratch type environment. So we'll move on from that. And then uh, more recent developments. The Scratch Go was actually my master's thesis research. Um, this device was a, a dedicated hardware device for Scratch. Um, and it was really a motion controller wrapped in kind of a really nice package with a rechargeable battery and a light sensor. Um, and then the idea was there were these three different attachment mechanisms that you could wrap the scratch fit in. And then you would use craft materials, your body, your toys, and those would become the sort of input for scratch. So you take the scratch fit, stick it to your body, and you could jump around the room. And now your body is the input device for scratch, not the scratch fit. Uh, the idea was really that the device would sort of disappear into whatever you were making. And then that larger creation would sort of become your mechanism for controlling scratch. Um, so that was just a research project. It may see the light of day at some point, but for now it just sort of sits on the shelf. Um, it was a really fun project to engage in. Uh, then I was deeply inspired by this work from uh, Susan Klim Klimzak and the South End Technology Center. They were doing a project they were calling Servos with a Cause, where they were using vinyl cutter to cut out copper circuits, which many in the FAB community are probably familiar with. Then they were soldering down AT tinies, programming them in C using AVR dude, and then kind of creating these moving interactive murals around them. And we just thought it was such a creative activity. Uh, you know, they were engaging all kinds of things, bringing in their, their own uh, personal things that they really felt passionate about and love and integrating that with their fabrication. But they had to know a lot to do this, right? They had to know how to do vinyl cutting, uh, circuit design, soldering, programming in C. So there's, there was this, a really big barrier of entry for this type of activity, um, but really great if you're in a fab setting, engaging in things like that. Um, so out of that work, uh, we developed these things, these programmable motors and lantern kits. So the one up in the top left here, this is really a direct descendant, I think, of as a, from the Servos with a Cause project where this is just a servo motor wrapped around a PCB, and the PCB becomes your sort of mount that you can use for attaching to craft materials. Um, and it's just a really simple programmable servo motor without a, sort of abstracting away some of the complexity of this, so you can really get at the heart of making. You can take this motor, integrate it into your craft materials, and then program it to do some simple behaviors. Um, it actually comes with a default program, which is just sweep the motor back and forth over 180. So if, you know, if that's good enough for you, you can just kind of see this motor as another craft material and integrate it into your creations. But then if you need to you know, 
fine tune that, you want to customize that behavior a little bit, you can then change the code on it. Um, in similar fashion, this was just a, a lantern kit, the board that goes into a lantern kit, where it's just four NeoPixel, four uh, addressable LEDs. Um, and the idea is that you would build that into something using paper, craft materials, into some sort of RGB lantern that you could then program the behavior of. Uh, so these are all kind of on either past projects or in the case of this motor and lantern kit, um, ongoing projects that may work into this, this overall system that we're calling Crafty Bits. Um, but just to give a little glimpse at sort of the, the trajectory or how we have sort of arrived at this Crafty Bits Geo Kit that we're going to talk about today. Um, and also to say, I was really interested in doing these, these kind of special case, these very specific micro world in a sense boards. Um, and then after talking with Brian and getting introduced to Alec, we, we kind of uh, agreed that doing a general purpose board or at least a little bit of a general purpose board could be really interesting. Uh, and that's how we arrived on the Crafty Bits Geo board that we're going to share and hopefully play with with you all today. So um, Crafty Bits Geo shares a lot of uh, similarities from those past boards I just mentioned. But instead, this one, it doesn't come with a pre-attached motor or pre-attached lights. Instead, it has these spring-loaded connectors on the edge of the board. Uh, so I can see, I'll hold one up to my camera. Actually, no, I'll wait till later since you probably can't see me that large. But these are, if you look at it from the side, there's four holes on the side here where you can just slot in wires, uh, you know, pin connectors, copper tape, aluminum foil, you could kind of roll up and shove in there. Any kind of connector. Yeah, it looks like Alex trying to show his from the side. So um, the idea is that you'll just kind of press down on one of these levers, stick your wire, stick your conductive material in there, and that becomes the way of interfacing with your physical objects. So it's really all about this edge connector on the far left is just dedicated five volts. Green is for outputs, purple, pink is for inputs, and black on the end for ground. On the side of that spring-loaded connector, there's this three-pin micro servo, co servo connector uh, because you know micro servos come with these sort of uh, female DuPont connectors, and then you'd have to have additional wires for interfacing with the spring-loaded. So since we love servo motors so much, we decided to just put a dedicated connector right there on the side for the servos. Uh, power and communication all go over USB right now. We have prototyped a Bluetooth version of this uh, for communication, and that may be available in the future. But for now, there's a real beautiful simplicity in feeding both power and communication in through USB. Um, if any folks have used Bluetooth devices before in a group setting or in a classroom setting, you'll notice how tricky and difficult that is with pairing process and making sure you're getting your device, not someone else's device. Um, so just to simplify that for now, we're just focusing on just the USB version of this board. Um, and also USB power is a really stable power. We know we get five volts out of it, which behaves a little bit nicer than battery packs or lithium batteries. And it's a little less volatile maybe than lithium batteries. And you can still use uh, portable battery packs. One of the ones that I love are these little uh, kind of tiny battery banks. And these are great for making your projects mobile or portable, uh, not making them stay tethered to a computer. Um, the center of this is this Nordic chip, which is a, uh, a Bluetooth enabled, uh, NRF 52805. It's got a Cortex M4 with 64 megahertz clock speed. Uh, but again, we're not using this for the Bluetooth capabilities right now, but we are using the radio inside of this chip. So there is a mechanism for talking between Crafty Bits Geo boards wirelessly. Um, and we have really great command blocks for that that we'll demo for you all today. Um, and then just kind of some subtle things. We have a little LED indicator on here for telling you what state the board's in. Um, a push button for starting and stopping your programs. And this works once you've programmed the board once, you can just bump this button again to run your last program again. So it retains all of the code that you're sending over to it. Um, and then we included these M4 or uh, 830 second mounting holes. So depending on what kind of hardware you have available to you, this can support uh, some mounting hardware. And I believe it's a 20 millimeter spacing off the top of my head, I can't remember, but I know Alec has more details on some of the mounts that he's been working on for this board. Uh, so the name geo came out of general purpose input output but then i mentioned it to a colleague and they said well you should call it the generally playful input output because that's more in line with the things that we're talking about so i said okay we'll keep that even though we're ignoring the p a little bit <laughs> we'll jam that in there and hyphenate it to make it work <laughs> um, so that's just kind of a high level overview of the crafty bits geo board but we'll talk more in detail as we start playing with it and throughout the workshops um, and then just maybe a brief mention of the software on the board so at the core of all these crafty bits is this, uh, this piece of software that we're calling the micro VM. 
Um, and it's just a very simple bytecode interpreter that runs just barely slower than C, which is something we've, we've kind of benchmarked and tested a bit. But um, basically, all of this is running in interpreted land. This is not downloaded and run in a traditional sense. You're not writing firmware. Instead, anything, any code you write gets converted, gets compiled into bytecodes, which gets sent down and stored on the device um, and run inside of this bytecode interpreter. Um, so for the front end on top of that, we've developed a logo inspired uh, text based language and a scratch blocks inspired uh, block space language, uh, but really anything is possible. So these are just the two languages of the two kind of environments that we've decided to implement for this, uh, this environment, but um, by no means is this the end. So, you know, you, someone could certainly do a Python, a Python interpreter, a JavaScript interpreter on top of all of this. Uh, we've just chosen these two language languages and we'll talk more about why we made that selection in the future um, and maybe just a, a quick note all of this the hardware and the software will be fully open source uh, we're by no means you know keeping this top secret once this device gets released um, all of the design files for the hardware all of the software will be released uh, fully open source so everyone can kind of tinker with it and modify it um, one of our fears around open source is that someone will sort of take the source code and immediately start adding complexity to the system without much uh, you know, thought going into that. And while we're not afraid of complexity and we, we're not opposed to it, uh, we really want it to be intentional in that the things that you're adding to this system and the new command blocks, the new, the new extensions that you're adding are really uh, fit within this idea of a micro world, that they work well with other parts of the system. So, Thinking through like adding something like I2C or SPI generic blocks maybe doesn't fit quite as well, but it would be worthwhile thinking about how could we start to integrate more advanced sensors into this type of system without really ratcheting up the complexity. So um, again, everything will be fully open source. It's not at this time, but um, it will certainly be by the time we release this. So now I think we're just going to run through a couple of examples. Hopefully Alec has one up and running on his system. Um, I've been playing with mine so much. I don't have a great example, but when we get to the demo, I can start to step through some of the really basic things I have on my desk here. So I'm going to stop sharing now. Looks like we see something on Alec's screen. I don't know. Yeah, I'm sorry. Just I'm be there in two seconds here. Let me just. Yep, uh, no worries. I'm not seeing the screen that I need to share on share. Uh, you're seeing everything, right? Uh, we just see a white screen right now, or at least I do. Yeah. Okay, let me just get rid of that, maybe. I've been in so many Zoom sessions where this happens to someone and not me, but now so there's a, I'm not getting my, uh, hold on. I'm getting tabs, not the actual share of the video. Sorry. In the meantime, maybe, uh, let me just get back here. Video. Nope. What is going on? Josh, I'm going to call on you for a second here. Yes, sir. How, uh, if you have something to show, that's a good time. <laughs> that's a good time while I figure this out. <laughs> well, let's, um, let me just real quickly to sort of begin to set the scene here in a non-threatening way. I'll, um, let me just bring the slides that I, I shared here as just some examples. Um, so the, the, the ideas that I shared, um, were two, two constructions that this first one, uh, let me throw it into present mode here, um, grew out of a project that one of my co former colleagues, uh, Dylan Ryder did with his um, fourth grade students, I believe. 
where they spent a week creating uh, habitats around their laptop screens. Um, they felted, they used some um, felting needles and felt to, to felt the animals. But I, I had saw an inspiring David Attenborough documentary on the Bower, Bower bird. And so I created a bower that fit around my laptop. And you can see there on the right, it just slid over the screen. And then I just used an off the shelf microcontroller that the Makey Makey that I like to call the world's dumbest keyboard where they give you up, down, left and right, um, the space bar and they throw in a mouse click for free and dug into the electronic trash and found a broken headphone and some, some brass from a um, soldering iron kit there to turn into my buttons. and you scratch, you just whip up a quick game where you're, you're catching things. So you're using the, the controls to go left and right and making the, the bird hop. And then the, the, the next one was um, uh, a project I just completed. Um, it's part of a series that I've been putting together over the years. I, I actually found photos from the first one. So it goes back to 2017. It's a series I've been exploring where, um, where I'm imitating nature using technology. So. This one, of course, is really hard to video, uh, but it, it's a firefly display that I programmed in, in Light Logo, and it's built around um, a 60 LED NeoPixel strip. So each of the LEDs is, is programmable, um, and a 3D printed base with a little LDR sensor emerging from it. And when it gets dark enough um, in the room, uh, the fireflies appear, and it and it it chooses whether to go forwards or back, and and does it either a short trail or a long trail. But um, the reason why I chose this is, is um, just because of the flexibility of logo. We often think of logo as being, uh, you know, something that just takes place with turtles on the screen, but Brian's light logo micro world um, opens up all sorts of fun new possibilities. Did I kill enough time? I think so, we're gonna, I got some help here. Cool. So I'm gonna go share, you get that. Yeah. You guys, can everyone see this? Yes. As a big screen? Yes. So that's, <laughs> this whole time I was trying to fix something that wasn't broken. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so, uh, so basically I've got a little example here that I can show. And this was just me, you know, tinkering. Um, so right now I've got I've got two micro bits. Uh, sorry, excuse me, crafty bits. So one is in this little cardboard box, and then I have another one attached to with a button going in and an output to a neo pixel ring. And right now they're in stand. They're in the. Um, I'm going to activate them. And if this works, yeah. So simply, I've got a button. When I press the button, it goes pink. And I can control the pace of this flippy cardboard thing. So if I press it really quickly, I can get something weird like that. This is part of an example of maybe playing around with something that's uh, going to be an animation tool of some kind that's really focused on craft um, and tinkering. So I'm going to stop that. That's my little bit of fun. And. Uh, Craig, I don't know, I can, I can certainly, I've got the ID on the right and I got the, the bits here so I can plug into a fresh one and we can go through that or, uh, and then sort of just do a quick demo. Does that work? Yeah, that's great. And actually, I think I have my setup working well enough now. Let me show, I have one quick demo and then let's see. Okay, hopefully this will work. Okay, I have uh, these nice little jewelry boxes that I love making lanterns with. So this is just a sheet of printer paper folded in a, a cube and then put inside of a, a jewelry box that has a NeoPixel ring inside of it. And then um, I have a, a little subroutine I named Rainbow that I'll run now. Let's see, it should still be connected, so I'll run Rainbow. Okay, and you can see it fades through all the colors and that Rainbow procedure is now downloaded to the device. So I can just come over now and just bump the button and it will run through that routine again. So that's just a really simple demo of doing a rainbow effect. And well, let's see if we can code this together at the same time. Let's see here. So I'm going to try to do this tricky thing with QuickTime where I show you my screen and my camera at the same time. Let's see if this works. OK. 
Okay. Actually, interesting. It looks like I don't have the ability to share my entire desktop. Is that a uh, is that a host setting that needs to be enabled? Oh, you're asking the worst host. <laughs> right. That's, that's uh, so strange. I've never seen it multiple. Before. I only it's have one, one window, window at a time. Is what it is what works. You have to close one and then open the other, and then you could share it. Ah, uh, oh, that's too bad. Okay, I was hoping I could show the whole desktop. Okay. Okay, well, what I'll do then is I'll share my coding window. And then if folks can still see my thumbnail, my thumbnail is the LED. So hopefully you can still find find me in the gallery. And then you're still seeing my uh, my sort of window here. So the first thing I'm just going to refresh just to get back to a blank slate. And then first thing is I'm going to click on the USB icon up here just to get paired up with my device. I've got mine plugged in. So there it is. Click connect. Okay, and now it pulled back in that uh, procedure I was mentioning. Actually, let me blow up my text a little bit to make this easier to read. So this is the procedure that was downloaded onto my device, um, and it is saved. The source code is saved on the device, and the next time you connect, it gets pulled right back in. And now all I have to do is just type rainbow and hit enter, and it will run that rainbow effect again. Uh, but this is kind of a full built out example. So just to avoid confusion, let's get rid of all of that and let's start with something really simple. So I'll go here and I'll say set LED all off and all the LEDs go off. OK, so over here on the left, this is our kind of command center. This is where we can run individual commands. And now I'll say set LED one. I'm going to go to 10 color 10. And we have a nice color table that we can show everyone for this. Um, and also, let me just show down at the bottom. If I get the zoom stuff out of my way. If you click on the little uh, help icon up here, you can get the documentation, uh, just all the different commands that you have available to you in this environment. Um, this is all really early. You know, the UI needs work. And because I'm zoomed in, it's kind of looking terrible now. It won't look so bad on your screen, hopefully. Uh, but these are all of the different commands that you have available to you in case you're looking for them. So I could say set LED 1 to 10. I could say set LED all to 10. And they all turn on. You can just do really simple things. Let's do set LED all off, weight 1,000 set LED all 50 goes off, waits a second, and then comes back on again. So, you know, using this command center, I can just send down individual commands. I can stack commands together. Now I can, like I mentioned before, I can come over and press this button. It's going to recall that last command. So all of this is downloaded to the device. So I could disconnect the device right now. Um, <clears throat> oops, yeah, there we go. I could disconnect the device right now and all of this code would be retained. I could plug it into the wall. Uh, and just bump that button again and it would run back. So let's maybe look at just doing a really simple routine. Hey, Craig, so is there a set, yeah. set strip size command? Uh, there's not. So right now what it is is the strip size is uh, the maximum size is 36 neopixels. It's a bit of yeah. an arbitrary size that we've selected. Um, oh, right. And that's ba based on you know how much power a USB port is supposed to be able to supply, which is only 500 milliamps. Yeah. Although I know there are some USB ports that can give more than that. So um, it is a bit of an arbitrary limitation right now. Uh, and we may you know, reconsider that in the future. The one thing we'd probably have to do is, is limit the brightness a little bit if we're letting you drive more and more NeoPixels. Yeah. So I think um, I definitely have something a, to talk about. I yep. think I have a 16 hooked up to it. And if I do set LED all 10, for example, it lights up six of them. So I wasn't sure if I can use all 16 or... What what LED? Oh, how many ring? What what size ring do you have there in your jewelry box? This one. This is a twelve ring here. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it is driving all of them. So there might be something going on with yours, or maybe it's a little finicky wiring. Uh, yeah. No, or something, you're right. So. You're right. It's yeah. probably my soldering on this one. I pulled it up. Yeah. The box. <laughs> right. You're right. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. It happens to me all the time. I'll solder them on and. Some of them won't won't light up, but yeah, um, yeah. So we can look at doing a really simple routine together just to demonstrate that. So if anyone remembers their logo syntax, logo is actually a new language for me. So I'm not one of the kids who grew up using logo, but I, I really love the simplicity and the beauty of this language. So we're going to define a a routine a procedure called two rainbow. And actually, let's make it take a parameter. Okay. So let's say first thing I want to do is I want to set a global variable, which in this case is called set box one to zero. Then we want to repeat 100 times since we have 100 colors. And we're going to say set LED all to the box one value, that current global variable. Then we can say set box one 
box one plus one. So let's increment that variable. And then finally, let's put a weight in there. Actually, maybe I shouldn't have named this weight just to avoid confusion. Let's call it W, variable W. So now we can say weight, whatever we pass in as a parameter. Okay, let's try this. So now I'm gonna go up here and I'm gonna click the download button to download these procedures to the device. Hopefully that worked. And now I'm gonna run rainbow with a, how long do we want the delay? Let's go with a really short delay, 10 milliseconds. Yeah, so we saw a really quick rainbow effect. We could turn this time, time down even more. Let's go one millisecond, yep. 100. We can slow the rainbow fade down. So just really simple ways that you can start to define these procedures. They can take parameters and they can affect things that you've plugged into the board. So this is just a really quick, easy example using the NeoPixels, but I thought maybe I'd show one more quick example using a servo motor and an input. So I'm gonna go ahead and unplug this. Whenever you're switching out what's connected to the board, it's always best to remove power just to avoid any short circuits or anything. So I'm just going to take my jewelry box out of the way. And I'm going to bring in, I have a, a potentiometer rotation knob with three wires pre-soldered in. So we're going to go red in red, black in black. This one I did not color code properly and I don't have I don't think I even have purple wires anyway so this one, since I know this is an input I have to go into the input port, which is the purple one. So we're going to plug that in I usually give them a little tug just to make sure they're nice and secure so that should be in. And then i'm going to take my servo motor and plug it in remember we mentioned we have that dedicated servo port on the side. So let's see if we can get this to stand up I always have the hardest time making these stand. Okay, there we go so hopefully that's all on frame yep. So let's put power back on this. Now the first thing, I guess maybe let's test the, uh, the input sensor and let's see if that one's working first. So in this system, nope, let me reconnect over USB. We have a nice print command. Print is good for printing out numbers. So if I say print one, two, three, four, the microcontroller prints one, two, three, four back to me. But I wanna print, what is, the, uh, what is the sensor value seeing that input port seeing on the device? So let's say print read A which is read analog. And if we run that, okay, it's 21. I'll turn the knob a little bit. I'll come back up and I'll run it again. Let me turn the knob this way. Okay, 76. So good, we're seeing the value changing as I turn the knob. But there's one feature that I really loved in the scratch environment, which was this ability to see inside of variables and get kind of a live readout from them. So we have a command here called, let's see, it's called mon. So I'm gonna loop, which is kind of a forever loop mon which is monitor one and then we're just going to read a so we're just going to look at that read a value so now if you see on the top of my editor i can see a sort of live snapshot of what is that sensor value right now and i can see it's got a nice range from zero up to 100. so we've scaled everything for now between zero and 100 just to make things as easy as possible and now let's see so we've got that working i can hit the stop button here or i can just run stop on my command center and that'll stop the current running program and now let's see so i've got the servo plugged in so let's try moving that so i'm going to run set servo zero which is degrees okay and it rotated to zero now i'm going to say set servo 180 rotated back to 180 good those work together let's join them with a weight in between okay so now we've got set servo zero wait a second set servo 180 this back and forth movement but now let's link up our, our sensor, our rotation knob with our servo motor. So for this, I'm just gonna run loop. Uh, let's see, set servo read A, and let's give it a little time to breathe. This is not necessary, but sometimes I like to give it a little bit of a delay there. So we're not doing things too, too quickly. So now I run that. Now, if I come over here and turn the knob, the servo motor is moving along with me. So that's it, it's just loop, set servo to read A, and if you discover, you know what, this sensor is only seeing between zero and 100, but my servo goes up to 180. It's not quite maximizing that range. Well, let's just go in and put a times two in there and run it again. And now we should have doubled our range. So yes, we're gonna run into the limits of the servo, but that's just fine. Now we can move that full range. If I wanna make this really sensitive, let's just put something bigger in there. Let's do like times eight. And now a little movement on the rotation knob translates to a big movement on the servo motor. So just to kind of show, and now you'll see it's kind of wavering around because that input sensor value is jumping a bit. So good opportunity to talk about low pass filters. Um, but 
that's just to demonstrate the sort of tinkerability of this system that when you're modifying your code, you know, you can just change a value, hit return, see it take effect uh, in real time in, in the physical world. And that we're really trying to just sort of eliminate these gaps between coding, testing, and debugging. We're trying to make the whole experience be a lot more tinkerable and just eliminating the, the separations, I think, between these different parts. Um, so that's just kind of a quick overview. Does anyone else want to show anything else? Alec, do you want to maybe play around with some of the remote box or the radio boxes? Sure. Um, let me, you know what might work uh, just for demo purposes. If you I'm trying to think here, okay, I will. So I have, it's not clear what to show, whether it's I should show the, 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 the crafty bit or the IDE. So maybe, um, do you want to call out some, I'll share the, I'll, I'll set up the, I'll set up the IDEs first. Okay, so my, my screen here is upside down and I have to do a stupid thing in Zoom where I flip the screen, I apologize for that. So it would be a bit confusing. Okay, so I have, um, let's just, and plug some things here. So I have my NeoPixel on one bit, and then I have a separate bit over here. They're both plugged into the same to the same um, computer right now. Um, so if I switch over to the IDE, I over here in the top right you have your USB. This is how you can check what's paired, and it's right now it's not. I have to sort of use the, my uh, intuition as to which one is connected. Um, but basically I have two window, two tabs open and they can show that once they're connected, I can see the, the different code that's on each of them. So these were lo already locked in on the, on the crafty bit. So I'm going to just delete that and do a quick, uh, a quick demo here. Let's do, uh, let's do to, to send and I'll set box. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Craig, here, but I'm going to go um, set our box one to read D for a digital input. So it'll be one and zero. Uh, and then I'll just put a little weight there of a weight 100. That has to be in a loop. So it keeps doing it. Oops. Uh, and so now if I attach a, um, I'm going to attach a, the backwards, so I'm going to attach a, a simple button to this, uh, basically five volts and then input. Okay, hopefully I'm on the right bit here. And if I switch back to the IDE, so I've got to hear my, my, my procedure. I'm going to go to the left here. I'm going to go, I'm going to call send. Let's see what, I, oh, wait, I want to put a monitor here. So loop, I want to monitor so I can see it. Mon one will be, um, read. so what I'm setting up here is a monitor one. I'll read the input of the button. And I'm going to download to that to the crafty bit. Now I'm going to call send. And there we got my monitor. And whenever I press the button, um, it should, it's not working, of course. You have to do some live debugging. Yeah. I mean, a really simple test is just running print read D in the command center just to see, like, can I get this button to return one and zero? And then and there's also, so Alex trying to do something really tricky, which is connecting two bits to the same computer, which we haven't really designed for just yet. So he's kind of asking for trouble, but <laughs> it's I was doing it all night, all night long, no yeah. problems. <laughs> Nobody yeah, was make sure your pins that. are. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, this sure probably pins are seated well. Yeah. If there was a bug in your code in the woods, did it make this thing not work? <laughs> Yeah, that happens a lot. Okay. Okay. 
let's just see. Uh, I'm going to try something here. Mm -hmm. I'm on the wrong bit. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> there we go. Excuse me. So, so yeah, this is where we were talking earlier saying it'd be nice to, I'm putting you on the spot here, Craig, to have some kind of way to identify which bit you're talking, talking to. Um, yeah. But yeah, that, so there we go. So now if I go call send here. Okay, so now right, I'm right, pressing, now the my, value. yeah, so now I'm pressing the button and okay, so that's simple. So now I'll go over to the other one and I'm gonna to go um, to receive and set our box one. Uh, so here we're gonna just say um, our box uh, loop. I'm gonna make another one here to receive. Alec, if it's not too much trouble, you could flip us back to your- Oh, I'm code. sorry, yeah, thank yeah, you. No. Okay, if our box one, equals one, um, we'll set, set LED all 10, um, if else. Otherwise we'll set it LED all 80, right? Da, 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 and then I need another bracket down here. Good, so that not getting hung up is a good sign. And then I'm going to call over now, receive. Whoops. And receive our box one. Um, I'm gonna go one, one, our box one. Oh, not working again, and it's hanging up. So I did something wrong. Oop, to receive, if else, our box one. I don't see anything immediately obvious right now. No, Maybe so this happened a couple of times. So I'm just going to actually unplug the the crafty bit and back in. I'm going to do a power cycle just to check that, uh, and I'm going to repair it. Oh, that's the wrong one. Um, okay, and then download, receive. Okay, so something's hung up. Is it receiving the commands right now? Uh, no, I it's it's I basically have got a uh, I've got it doing something, but it's not not the right thing right now. So I can actually unplug the other one. I can close this IDE because I've already got this code on the on the bit, right? So I don't need that. I can just run it. Oh, I see something. I have to activate that. Oh, there we go. I didn't have my second bit activated. So oh. okay. So that that simply. So these are radio right now. They're wireless. So no Wi-Fi issues. Thank you. Um, I'm moving backwards here. Uh, the number of times we've been caught in our, you know, in, in workshops because, you know, the the trying to test hardware out with the Wi-Fi, you have to call IT and get them to change permissions and such, and it's a big headache for them. So the fact that it's radio is fantastic, and yeah, so there you go. That's the radio. So I can have this on the other side of the room and uh, mess around. That's great. Thanks for showing that, Alec. I think it's no it's no easy task pulling together multiple bits, multiple tabs all at the same time. So no, um, actually, I didn't, if you could jump. Yeah, go ahead. I was gonna I was curious if you could show that one more time. I just wanted to demonstrate one part of this. Uh, actually, your camera view. Yeah. So if you look at the bits right now, the LED indicator is red on them, which means that there's some program running. So just as an example, if you bump the button on this NeoPixel one. Or either one, yeah. If you bump the button, that's going to stop the running program. So green is kind of, or uh, blue is a ready state. And that's now, why it wasn't Alec, working. Yeah, I didn't so know that that was running wasn't right working. now. Yeah. yeah. So, now, if you bump the button again, it should recall that last program, which was. And this is not attached radio. to the IDE or anything. So this no. could be on your power bank or. Yeah. Yeah. Just to demonstrate that. Yeah. Thanks, Alex. That's great. <laughs> <laughs>
and I'm upside down. There you go. Okay, so um, and uh, so I guess we can open up to Q and A. I guess if there's anybody that has questions, uh, and then though the the we're going to do a uh, over the next three days, we're going to be exercising the idea of messing around with cardboard code and creativity and seeing what people come up with. And some some of us are lucky. We were able to get a few uh, micro bits out there. Uh, sorry, uh, crafty bits out there. So um, those who have those can will we'll workshop them together. But if you want to participate and have uh, you just want to show what you can do with your board of choice and cardboard and sort of this sort of creative thinking, uh, then we encourage everyone through the week just to have a little fun making with us. Um, so right now, I guess any Q and A, um, any Q and A for for Craig, Brian, myself. No questions. Is the communication published, subscribe, or peer to peer? It'd be peer to peer, um, low level NRF proprietary radio. So um, yeah, so just peer to peer, no subscribing. Uh, and one nice benefit to that is we'll, we'll likely bring the microbit into the system since it also uses a Nordic chip and it can use that same proprietary radio. Um, so that'll likely be just kind of an addition or one additional board you can use within this system. And, and also the right now it's running on Chrome, right? So I, I, at the moment, you, you, Chrome, you have to use Chrome for the IDE, I believe. That's right. So WebHID is a is a nice standard because it doesn't require any like helper application to be installed on your system. Uh, the downside to WebHID is I think Chrome is the only major browser right now with built in support. Uh, so until WebHID gets more wide adoption or until we kind of do a helper application to install on your system, it's, it's pretty much bound to Chrome. Um, yeah, so at some point we might compile an offline version of the application that has the, the hid stuff built into it. But for now, if you want to use it in the browser, it would have to be Chrome. Right, yeah, but it's also possible that we shift to Web Serial. Yeah, I'm, I'm not actually, I think Web Serial might be in the same boat unless it has broader support, but I think it might be pretty similar. So there's uh, another question here. Um, can you reference more than one device? So, oh, so yeah, in what way, I guess, um, like from one IDE program, multiple devices? Yeah, so I'm, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not who, um, so Pete, I'm not sure if I got your question right. Um, yeah. Actually, Alex, should we suggest that since it's a small enough group of people that people just unmute themselves? Yeah, of course. Uh, do I have to do that? It should be. Hello, guys. I have Hi. a little question. Uh, we have the <laughs> the little yes. bus, and um, there is a, a sample or a cheat sheet to see to program the the little blocks with the with the little bars. Sorry. Um. So you what what was the question? Could you repeat it? Yeah. Sorry. Because if you have a little uh, cheat sheet. To see the, the program or the or 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 add a sample to program, for example, you have this is the blocks to program a servo. This is the blocks for program the neo pixels. Different examples, because we don't see the first part of the of this uh, meeting. Sorry, <laughs> I don't know if you put it in the chat or something similar. Oh, the 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 IDE. Yes, the IDE. Yes. Let me I'll just show two. two yeah, go ahead. I'm gonna put the, the. Can I put the blocks one up as well? We have a question yes, about yeah. Okay, so yep. here's a block a block space one which Craig could talk about, and I'll put the 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 code one. So let me just um, open up the IDE real quick. So if you're in the code editor, uh, and we can we can step through doing some really simple things again, but uh, if you're in the code editor, if you click on this little question mark up top, this will show you the available commands to you. So if you're looking like how do I just do outputs, go to the outputs tab. Um, and like, for example, set servo degree. So if you want to try this out, you just come up here to the command center and run set, if, you, if I can type set servo, you know, 180 for 180 degrees. Or you could say set servo zero, wait 1000, set servo 180. And that would move it to zero degrees, wait a second, and then move to 180 degrees. So these docs can be helpful for getting you started there. Um, we will have more rich examples in the future, but for now, this is just kind of getting it ready for this session. Um, so this is the text 
environment, logo inspired. But if you'd rather program it with blocks, you can come over here to the blocks environment. Uh, and basically what you have here is an undeletable hat block. Uh, if anyone's used Scratch before, these are called hat blocks because they go on top of the stack. And you'll see if I try to throw this away, I can't because this is basically my one starting point for my program. Uh, and then to code something similar on this one, we would say, you know, set servo to zero, wait, thousand milliseconds, oops, 1000 milliseconds, and then set servo to 180. So this would be the same kind of program, but in the scratch environment instead. Um, and same thing, you know, you click this to connect and then hit the play button to send this code down and run it on the device. Uh, so the scratch blocks are very tinkerable. You know, you can go ahead and put it in a repeat if you want to repeat this. Okay, thank you so much. This yeah, amazing. absolutely. Great. Yeah, we, we use this, the same blocks for uh, programming the micro bit and it's similar to, to this. Okay, thank you so much. Yes, yeah. No, you're welcome. Yeah, we've tried to keep the language fairly similar to what you would see in Scratch. Um, it may be quite a bit different than other blocks environments like make code. Um, I think they've taken the, the complex route. Um, they have all kinds of crazy blocks in there, which are great for making really powerful projects, but not so great for you know getting started quickly or, or comprehension. So yeah, you'll see okay. some similarities to Scratch. Thank you. So, um, OK, thank you. Now we need a little time to practice. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because... yeah, so that's, that's tomorrow will be a good time to have played. If you can play a bit before tomorrow and then, and then have more questions, and, and we'll talk a bit more about the, the logo language tomorrow as well. And, Okay, thank you so much. Um, Dean has a question about the whether or not the the milling um, the the I guess the traces and the milling paths will be available. I guess uh, when you're open when it's open, will you have like the the ego files or or things like that? That. Yep, absolutely. So I actually use um, KiCad or KiCad. I don't know actually how it's pronounced for all my designs, and mainly because it's open source, anyone can pick up my my project files and you know see how the board is laid out, see how everything is milled, make modifications of their own. Uh, so all of the KiCad project files will be released open source so that everyone can have access to that. Yeah. Okay, so right right now you have to use Chrome, I guess, because when I I'm in Firefox, when I try to go to your crafty bits, it I, it just hangs up there. Uh, that, that's so, right. Yeah, but that's the main that's the main project page where all the information will be uh, whenever whenever you're done with the project. Correct. Crafty uh, bits crafty bits net. Net. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So right now you'll just see kind of an animated logo on there. Um, that's where all of the information will be once it's available. Yeah. But so far as the challenge, we should still be able to use the online uh, uh, interface there to do some coding if we wanted to. Right. Yep. Yeah. You can still use the interface. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, with Firefox, I don't think they have any plans of bringing WebHID anytime soon. So well, I, I, I've got here. Chrome. I mean, I can open it up in Chrome. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I guess uh, what you're saying is people could, if they're in Chrome and they're programming, you you have a uh, crafty bit and we, could, we should be able to, uh, uh, over the internet, uh, do something with your crafty bit. Is that correct? Uh, so we don't have remote, um, actually like remote control just yet. One thing, I think Zoom has screen sharing or remote control available now. So if we wanted to, I could load up the ID I don't know if our Zoom session will allow it, but we could try to let someone take over control. Um, we haven't done like a totally remote protocol into it just yet, but let's see if this works. Let's just see if Zoom gives us this ability. So I'm gonna try sharing mine. Let's see if someone tries up at the top, it should say like something like Craig is screen sharing. And maybe Alec is the only one who would have the ability. Alec, can you see if you can take remote control of my screen? Does it give you any option up top? Um, not that I can see. It's okay. Request remote control. Oh, you're still okay. Brian's requesting remote yeah. control, so I'm going to allow Brian. Oh, in. Brian's oh, wait, I have to. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to let. Let me. I have to go into my system preferences and en enable this for Zoom. And I think I might have to jump out of the call and back in real quick. But if someone wants to try running some commands, we definitely could open this up. <laughs> I'd be happy to dedicate mine, yeah. Let's see. So I have to give Zoom permission. All right, I'm gonna quit out and I'll be right back into the meeting. So I've been, you know, tinkering with this for a while and I've, I've been very impressed already. It's very st it's stable. Uh, I haven't had many issues. It's fantastic.
it looks like it's a lot of fun. Uh, how, how young a, a, a students have you had actually using this? This is like fresh off of the Craig's desk. And so yeah, really, okay. it's, it, we're, this is version 0. I don't know what. Okay, we got to find some children then and see uh, and, and yes. some coding. Okay. So, so the LC, uh, so my the school I work for, North Carolina College, bought we bought uh, a, we we basically have a, a handful and then we distributed a few. We put out some feelers early and we distributed a few around. Uh, but we'll be testing it with uh, I think middle school and senior school students. And then uh, Fiona, who is over in our lab, uh, I don't know if she's still there, but she would be the one that would really um, bring it to the junior school level. But it's certainly, uh, I know she's done turtle art and other things like that um, with the, the junior school kids. And so, yeah, we'll, we'll be doing a lot of testing in the fall, I think, on this. And, and, I, and we have a lot of, like most schools have a lot of micro bits as well. So we'll see how we can integrate those two uh, together as well. Greg wants to be let back in. Yes, he does. Are you going to let him? I did. Yeah, I let him in. I just wanted him to wait and sweat a bit. <laughs> Sorry, Craig. All right, no worries. I'm back now. <laughs> so let's try this again. So I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to blow up the resolution a little bit. Hopefully, it'll make it easier for folks to see. All right, now someone, let's see, who was asking about this? Was it? Dean, do you want to try taking control? Well, I, I, I'm running Firefox right now, so I was thinking I might try tomorrow. You, you've got other sessions coming up. And so oh, you actually I don't have... need to be using Chrome for this. It's just within the Zoom editor. If you go up, oh, to, the top, okay. well, you go up to the top, I think it says Craig is screen sharing. There should be a way yeah, to say view options. Control. Yeah. View oh, options. yeah. Request remote control. Yeah. Yep. Welcome to, okay. View options. Let's see. Well, you better let somebody else who knows what they're doing do it. <laughs> right. Take me to Does someone else want to try out. driving. Yeah. And I'll do my homework so I can do better next time. All right. Time. No worries. <laughs> um, Maria, when you're asking for uh, the the um, the schematics, do you mean just right now, just the in, the input outputs, the the I outputs, or do you mean the actual? schematic for the, the board that can be um, manu made. In any case, we'll, uh, we'll share, I think the slide that, uh, that Craig put up with uh, the, the inputs and outputs, um, this one. And then whenever Craig makes this open source, then I'm sure there'll be a folder with all that stuff. The, the... I'm actually really interested in seeing how we can use, like one of the things that I was always interested in when I did the Fab Academy was how fun it was to mill a PCB and how I wish I could do that with kids, but it's just like, it's such a, it's a many levels of complexity there that I haven't yet delved into, but to be able to mill simple circuits, sim uh, to be able to mill simple sensors and things like that would be a lot of fun. And I really excited about how these can be, and I've already mentioned this, like how this could be a way to gather, you know, to read sensors. And I don't know if it makes sense for the micro world concept, but to be able to gather dat data from sensors and, um, and then use that to do something with. And then if kids could mill, you know, big pads and, and you know, it could be a lot of fun. The traces don't need to be so small. All right, well, um, I don't know if there are any more uh, questions about I'll do is I'll just uh, basically um, tomorrow at 1.30. Uh, so hopefully you've had a chance to uh, play around. If you wanna make something in cardboard with the board of your choice, that's fine. So we've got like a little challenge here. Uh, so basically we're asking everyone to sort of make a functional prototype of an object that you would be proud to exhibit in your museum or in your lab. So whatever you think of, like it could be something useful, it could be something artistic, uh, and you're trying to get your design to highlight creative uses of cardboard and code and try to limit yourself to cardboard, uh, four millimeter um, nuts and bolts. So um, 
you know, I, I, this, this is a great idea, Craig, um, to just get like a, something you can easily get at a home hardware. So M4 or uh, 832 um, fit really nicely and they fit perfectly in the crafty bit. I've, I've gone and made a, like a template here. I'm gonna sh actually share um, something in the, hold on a second. I'll share the file here. Um, the, this is on the, the actual link. Um, I'm gonna present here. So this is actually in the link to the, to the workshop. And all, over here, I've got a link to an SVG file, uh, which you can use if you want. Um, and basically what that is, is just this template with all the, the mounting holes. So these are, um, these smaller holes fit the, the crafty bit perfectly. Um, so they'll mount perfectly on there. And, and, then, and then also um, the bigger holes here is perfect for dowel, six millimeter dowel. And then there's just these little like engraving marks that I put so you can actually, you know, start crafting boxes and such such. So that's there to share. Uh, if you want to mess around with that. And again, if you don't have a, a crafty bit, you could use your micro bit or something else. Um, yeah, and so design constraints, you know, and try embedding the electronics uh, and design for disassembly is always a good constraint, to, uh, I find. And um, see how much, you know, I'm trying to do everything in cardboard, uh, even the, the mounting, like I made a, a 3D printed part for the servo, uh, which was, you know, sort of a really nice way to do it. It was nice and solid, but um, this, you know, I thought it would be fun to make one out of cardboard. So I've actually just got layers of cardboard holding the servo motor in there. And what's nice about this kind of thing is like, as I'm going, I'm like, oh, that's a little weak. And I just add more cardboard or I chop away. I wanted to integrate the, you know, the USB into it. And I didn't do it. So I just basically used a, a dull knife that I had in front of me at the time. So I can have access uh, to the side. What's nice about this is that you can now, the same way that you're tinkering with like in a fab lab when you get comfortable drawing things and then going cutting and then iterating, you can kind of do it as a mixture of code and working with your hands, digital fabrication. There's all kinds of ways to, to, to sort of prototype. And I remember at the Fab Academy doing the machine design and I remember working with cardboard first, but it, this would have been a really fun um, you know, this would have been really fun to have this, these um, crafty bits available then. That would have been really fun to see what you could do. Okay, so um, yeah, uh, that is basically it. So there's uh, the challenge if you, want, if you want to work on it. And then um, tomorrow uh, we're going to basically sort of those who are playing around will debug, ask questions and see what, how, what people are working on. Uh, we'll do a quick recap, I guess. Uh, and we're gonna bring in, talk more about Logo and how uh, sort of the idea that Logo is broader than they think and also the idea of tinkerable materials and tinkerable tools. And so we can have a discussion as, as to what you're using maybe in your fab lab or in your space, um, share some ideas and uh, get a little bit more about the lo Logo programming language and the crafty bit geo platform. So that's that's it. Unless there's more questions, we're we're all here. Um, but thank you for your time and your patience, and and not laughing at my Zoom errors. At least I couldn't hear or see you laughing, so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Craig, if you had just a minute, uh, yeah, <clears throat> you were saying that you would ha could share your screen. I'm trying to figure out how to actually enter onto your uh, screen here. So what what am I looking for? Okay, so now that I'm screen sharing, hopefully you're seeing my screen. I see your screen. Yeah, and then up at the top, it, it should say something like Craig is is sharing his screen or yes. something along those lines. And then just next to that, there should be like a view options. View options. Drop down. Got it. Request yep. mode and, control. There it is. Okay. Yep, there so it is. So I go can and click request on that. that. Okay. Now I'm going to approve it. So let me go ahead. Let me plug in a servo motor to the board. Let me do a little setup here on my end. Plug this in, plug power back in. I'm gonna switch my camera back so everyone can see the servo motor sitting on my desk. Okay, all right. And then let's go ahead and just reconnect, connect. All right, and so now you should be able to type. So go ahead and type set servo and give it a, give it a degree measurement. Okay, set. Oh, it's working, wow. Yeah, so okay. no space between set and oh, servo. Okay, just one got it, word. okay, yeah. set. Yep. Servo. 
yep. and then space. Space, yeah, and then the degree then, you want to jump it to. Okay, so I might go st the starting degree, or I could just go to ninety or something like. Yep, that. just go to ninety, hit return. Renner, okay. there it goes. I saw it jump. And it jumped. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so this works. Yep. So you Amazing. can try maybe put a weight after that. So go back up to that line, add a space, and then you can put a weight. Oh, okay. The, with the column. Yep. Uh, no, just just the word wait. Oh, just the word wait. Okay. Yes, and then space. How how many milliseconds do you want to wait? Oh, okay. So I could go. All yep. right. Space, and now let's do another set servo to set it to a different position. Okay, set servo to one eighty. Yeah. Now, don't return down. If you put a return after that, wait five hundred. Just return. Just delete that return. You want them all to be kind of on the same line, continuous. Oh. Okay. Yeah, because we want to run these all. Sorry, I was trying to move my mouse and I realize I'm <laughs> fighting you for control. <laughs> yeah, and just put a space in there. Put a space. Yeah. Oh, okay. So I've got rid of that. Okay. So it'll just do an automatic line ramp. Okay. Yep. Yeah, exactly. So just go ahead and return and so on that now one. Now I go to the end of the line, hit return, and I'm watching. Yeah, you, you can hit return here. anywhere inside of the line, but yeah, I'm going to do that. Yeah, I did it. Okay. And it flipped well, let's back. Let's see. Let me, let me bump, I'm going to bump the button on my side. Yep. Yeah, so there's yep, your command. Working. So, okay. Yep. Yeah, well. So that's it. So we don't we don't we don't need the crafty bit. We can just plug into yours. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. I just need I just need ten computers with ten dedicated crafty right. bits. <laughs> okay. Ready to go. Okay. Hey Craig. So yeah. when we did that, so the left the left side the command the command center. Yeah, right, that's what it's called the left the left uh, window. Um, it's like I always tell students, and when we're using light it's like marching orders. It's like you're following this exact thing right now. But I noticed that you can you were able to recall even that with just by pressing the button on the crafty bit. That's right. So the crafty bit will just rerun whatever the last command was. So if I come down here and I say print one, two, three, four, it does that. And if I bump the button, oh, I didn't it just know recalls that. that last command. That's yeah, cool. So it's whatever last command ran. Now it is a design question though, because I think there's another strategy we could have is we could have a dedicated procedure name. So maybe we want the two start to always recall when you bump the button. And this is just a consideration. And I know there's been various systems over the years that have tried out these different strategies. Um, so we could have the button always call a dedicated routine. Or in this case, right now, what it's doing is it's just recalling that last thing, no matter what it was. So in this okay. case, it's the print. Yeah. Yeah. But something to think about for sure. Wow, that's, a neat, that's a neat feature. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah, good way to test. And the, and... The, the play button here will do the same thing as bumping the button on the device as well. So if I just click right. this, it'll just recall the last command. Yeah, got it. So, so each each command basically reflashes the uh, microcontroller. It does. It kind of yeah. It resets what's uh, stored in the flash memory. It, it, it or at does. Least, yeah. it, it, in yeah. fact, the commands in the actually they run out of RAM, aren't they? I guess not if they're if the button works. Yeah, they're all flash at this stage. I, I don't think yeah, we're doing anything out of RAM anymore. Yeah. 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 But you could do something more complicated by using the box on the right and, and setting up more of a, uh, yes. is that what you call it a subroutine over there? Or... Exactly. So even taking what you did is like, let's call it like, let's make a sweep function and we can say set servo zero weight. Let's make it take in a, a variable called W, set servo 180 end. And now let's download this. And now if I come over here, I can say sweep. And I think you put a 500 millisecond wait. So if we do sweep 500, it does something similar. Okay, and I Craig, can... you want to put a second yep. weight W at the end and then do two sweeps with different numbers? Oh, sure, no, like no, um, no, just, just do it. Well, just one input, just use the same weight both times. Oh, okay. Do wait W. You're saying like this, Brian? Yeah, and then do sweep 2000, sweep 500. Oh, okay, yep, so let's download that. Sweep 2000, sweep 500. So you can see one slow one and one fast one. Yeah, so one slow one and one fast one, right, yep. Uh, routines can be called within routines, so you could have another routine to go <laughs> that does exactly what we just said. Sweep 2000, sweep. 500 and let's download these two routines and now we could just come over here and say go and that's the same thing as just running that command again so yes your your subroutines your procedures can call procedures and yeah you can play with recursion which is always a lot of fun <laughs> great thank you
Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad you were able to drive it. <laughs> Anyone else feeling adventurous want to <laughs> try to code the servo? <laughs> All right. So tomorrow, one thirty. Try this again. Talk more about logo and uh, have more fun with this. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much. That was Thank terrific. You. Great. Thanks for coming. Thanks. Thanks for coming, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.